It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. And good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. The Members' Integrity Act obliges MPPs to, quote, arrange their private affairs in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity of each member. Earlier this year, it was reported that developers and lobbyists were sent requests for donations to a stag and doe from people connected to the Premier and who previously worked for him. People who received these donation requests told Global News they felt browbeaten into buying those tickets. Does the Premier believe such behaviour promotes public confidence in his integrity? To reply, the government host leader. I think the Premier has, uh, has, answered, uh, has answered that question on a number of occasions, Mr. Speaker. But to tell you what the Premier does believe in and what, in fact, all uh, progressive Conservatives on both sides of the House uh, believe in, Mr. Speaker, and that is making sure that this uh, current generation of Ontarians who are working hard to build a, a bigger, better, stronger Ontario have all of the same advantages that the previous generations of Ontarians had, including most members who sit in this House, Mr. Speaker. That is, if they contribute, if they help us build a bigger, better, stronger Ontario, they will also have the dream of home ownership. It is the same dream that generations of, uh, of indiv individuals from across the world came to this uh, country uh, hoping for, Mr. Speaker, and that is what we're building. Every single day in this House, the Leader of the Opposition uh, can stand in the way of that. We saw them do it over 15 years with their Liberal partners, and we will continue Fonts. to remove every single one of the obstacles that they put in place that made Ontario one of the most difficult places to own a home, Mr. Speaker. We won't stand for that, and we'll make sure. The supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier is very clearly offside with what real Ontarians are feeling and experiencing right now. And just yesterday, I was at an event uh, a couple days ago in York Centre, and somebody told me, you know, it feels like a return to that kind of old school, who you know politics. The rules are very clear. A member or a premier may not accept a gift connected to their duties. Does the premier agree with this basic ethical principle? Speaker, uh, again, this government is singularly focused on improving the lives of the people of the province of Ontario. As I just said, for generations, one of the bargains that was made here in the province of Ontario was that if you came to Ontario to help us build a bigger, better, stronger province in the best country in the world, that there would be a home option available to you. That was what we built this province on. Now, for 15 years, the Liberals and the NDP put obstacle after obstacle after obstacle in the way of building new homes for that uh, uh, for the people of the province of Ontario. And what are we doing? This Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, this government, is removing every one of those obstacles because we know how important it is not only for the young generation of this, uh, of this province to be able to have the same dreams that all of us, that our parents and that our grandparents had, and that is the dream of home ownership, Spons. Mr. Speaker. So the Leader of the Opposition can say anything she wants. She can continue to try and frustrate those dreams. She can continue to try and put obstacles in the way. We will continue to remove every single one of those obstacles. And the final supplementary. Seemed like a pretty straightforward question. I'm a little shocked that they couldn't answer that one. Uh, Speaker, public confidence in the integrity of MPPs and cabinet ministers and premiers is not just about avoiding actual conflict of interest, but also avoiding the appearance of conflict of interest, just like in every other sector. I mean, these are very simple rules, but clearly some in this House are having a hard time understanding them. So to make this even clearer, I'm going to table legislation later today to bring Ontario in line with the Federal Conflict of Interest Act. Does the Premier support a prohibition on gifts that a reasonable person might believe were given in order to influence an MPP Order. or even a Premier? Government House Leader. Again, Mr. Speaker, here's the NDP then. That could have stopped. That could have stopped the destruction that was the former Liberal government when they held the balance of power. Order. Did they vote in a non-confidence motion to remove them when we were dealing with cash for access? No. They propped them up and kept them in power, Mr. Speaker, and continue to put obstacle after obstacle after obstacle in the way of people owning their first home, Mr. Speaker. Now the NDP, over 150 years, the NDP and parties have governed this province once. 
Once, Mr. Speaker, in the last election, more than 833,000 people turned their back on the NDP, removed 10 of their members and put them on this side of the House and on that side of the House as progressive conservatives. When will the NDP learn, Mr. Speaker, that it doesn't matter how often you change the messenger, it's the message that the people of Ontario aren't interested in. They are interested in a strong, progressive, conservative Ontario and all of the benefits that come with it. Order. 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 <laughs> Government side, come to order. We start the clock. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. This isn't just about maintaining trust in government, it's about accountability. And when it comes to the planned redevelopment of Ontario Place, the lack of accountability and transparency is glaring. The government's plan to hand over extremely valuable public lands on Toronto's waterfront to a private European developer to build a luxury spa and a giant parking lot are not going over very well. And now the Premier is making back-of-the-napkin musings about moving the Ontario Science Centre to the location. Speaker, is this an attempt to distract from the real and growing opposition to the plan to turn Ontario Place into an elite spa? Yes. And to apply for the government, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we have been fully transparent with the public in terms of what our intentions are for the site since Order. 2019. They just don't like Mr. It. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are leasing the lands. We have a tenant in place. We have a development application with the City of Toronto. We are proceeding with the environmental assessment work that is underway. We have made tremendous progress on the site. But what's most important, Mr. Speaker, is the sentiment of the public. People drive by the site and think, what a waste that we let Order. the site deteriorate deteriorate to the point of it no longer being safe for people and pedestrians to be able to go there. We are bringing the site back to life. We will make sure it is there for everyone in Ontario to enjoy. Thank you. The supplementary question. I mean, Speaker, it sure seems like they're making it up as they go along, right? And there is so much potential. There is so much potential to make Ontario Place a truly vibrant public space again. And, Speaker, the Ontario Science Centre is a treasured public institution. It's one that sees thousands of visitors every year in a part of the city Order. that really benefits from its presence. It employs hundreds of people, good union jobs and is an anchor to Flemington Park and Thorncliffe Park, some of Toronto's priority neighbourhoods, Speaker. To the Premier, has this government consulted with local communities about the plan to relocate the Science Centre, its attractions and its jobs? Nope. Minister of Infrastructure. I will agree with the member opposite on one thing. The Science Centre is a public treasure, which is why our government, for the for the last number of years has been looking at whether or not the option of relocation to preserve the Science Centre should take place. Now, the structure itself has Order. deteriorated as well, as has Ontario Place. Our government is making the financial investments necessary to preserve these two treasures, to bring them back to life, to make them a place that everyone can go and enjoy with their families. Here, here. I 100% think the public is behind us on this here, one. There and the final supplementary. Speaker, the circumstances around this government's paving over, carve up of the green belt, and this continued lack of transparency by the Premier means that every land use decision by this government is tainted by suspicion. That's the fact. When the Premier muses about massive changes to provincial institutions with no evidence at all, not even pretending to have community involvement, it raises questions. So I have to ask, Speaker, to the Premier again, are any developers with ties to the Conservatives pushing to move the Ontario Science Centre? Mr. 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 Speaker, perhaps I was not clear in my previous answer. 
The Science Center has been in existence since 1979. Now, very little over, over the past number of years has been given to the Science Center in order to rehabilitate it and keep it alive. It is falling apart. During COVID, in fact, we had to close a bridge to make sure that those attending the Science Center could be safe and the workers could be safe. On so you said it yourself, Mr. Speaker, it is a treasure and we are doing everything we can to preserve it, such as looking for a new opportunity and new homes so that many children in the future could enjoy this wonderful treasure that we have. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This month, uh, the government doubled down on expensive sprawl. They forced municipalities to open thousands of more hectares uh, of farmland to development. They've eliminated density requirements in new subdivisions, and they've eliminated targets to build more housing in areas already zoned for development. My question is this, why is this minister doubling down on sprawl when there are better ways to build more housing? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. This allows us to talk about uh, how we have a plan and how our plan is working for Ontarians. The latest data shows that Ontario has seen an 11 per cent increase in 2023 on new housing starts, up nearly 1,200 from last year. Rental starts, so far, Speaker, are double what they were at the same time last year. Ontario is the number one jurisdiction for business jobs and newcomers. There are more active cranes right now, Speaker, in the City of Toronto than there are in New York, Chicago, LA, Washington DC, Seattle, yeah. and San Francisco. Come by. Come by. We're going to continue to move forward with our aggressive plan to build 1.5 million homes by 2031. And let's face it, Speaker, it already sounds like the opposition is looking for a reason Spons to, for the fifth time, oh. vote against more housing oh. in our province. The supplementary question. The Conservatives' track record on making housing affordable is abysmal. Housing has never been more expensive to rent or buy, and that's your legacy. Across Ontario, homeowners are seeing their property taxes Order. go up and their services get cut. And these tax hikes are going to continue if this government continues to build sprawl, because sprawl is much more expensive for municipalities to service than building more homes in existing neighbourhoods. My question is to the Premier. Why double down on sprawl when there are cheaper and more affordable ways to build the housing that we need? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Again, Speaker, we're always going to stand up to reduce the baseline costs of housing to make it cheaper and faster for affordable homes to be built. The opposition will always stand up for higher taxes and higher housing costs every single time. They have. You know, but again, now we're hearing from the opposition. So, so here it is after our announcement uh, you know, for the Bill 97. Now we're starting to hear some of the real NDP coming forward. So they're standing up against farmers having the opportunity to sever a lot for their son or daughter. Shame, sure. That's where the NDP is moving. They're going to stand against hard-working farmers and giving those sons and daughters the opportunity to create lots Order. or the opportunity to create uh, housing for workers, something that, that our government believes is something that we need to move forward on. This is where the NDP are standing. They're standing against farmers. They're standing in favour of NIMBYism. That's the new NDP. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Markham, Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. My speaker is for the Minister of Education. Ontario's education system must prioritize teaching students the skill they need to succeed. The most fundamental of skills that students must learn are reading and writing. Without a comprehensive understanding of these two subjects, we know that students cannot progress with their learning in a meaningful way. The situation has been made all more serious as an outcome of disruption to in-person learning. This is why it is imperative to help our students gain or regain proficiency in these subjects so they are able to excel in their classrooms and in their lives. Speaker, 
Can the minister please explain how our government is supporting reading and writing skills development for our students? To apply for the government, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. I want to thank the member from our Communityville and all members of their house for their support on the work we're doing to boost literacy in this province by lifting standards, by demanding better, and by investing in a plan that goes back to the basics so that our young people can master the skills that matter most, reading, writing, and math. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I was proud to join the parliamentary assistant to announce $180 million of investment to lift standards and outcomes for young people in the province to hire a thousand frontline reading specialist educators and math educators, to double the amount of math coaches. Mr. Speaker, specific to reading, supporting the Ontario Human Rights Commission's Right to Read report, we are introducing the largest reading screening in the country. Every child, senior kindergarten to grade two will be screened this coming September. A new overhaul language curriculum that follows the science of reading, again recommended by Ontario Human Rights Commission, and more staff in place Response. to help those kids that need support to get up to the provincial standard. This is supported by the Canadian Children's Literacy Foundation, by Dyslexia Canada, by Community Literacy of Ontario, and many others who are urging us to move forward. With Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Minister for that exciting response. It is encouraging to hear the actions of our government is taking with respect to reading and writing skills development. However, there are other fundamental skills our students need to learn, as many of the jobs of the future requires an understanding in math and other STEM subjects. Students' math scores across North America and in Ontario have seen an alarming decline over the past several years. With a return to in-person learning it this school year, our governments must have a comprehensive plan to help our students develop their math skills. Speaker, can the minister please describe how our government is supporting math learning recovery as well as plan to continue improve mathematics understanding for Ontarian students? Minister of Education. It starts with a modern curriculum that mandates financial literacy and coding that's aligned with the labour market. Mr. Speaker, it also starts with a plan, a $71 million investment to lift standards in mathematics to provide accountability with more frontline resources. We're going to double the amount of math coaches in our schools. We're going to ensure every school board in Ontario has one senior lead whose singular mission is improvement in their boards. We have a math improvement action team in the ministry for the first time. We're going to deploy to school boards who have historically been underperforming. That lower 20% of schools that still need to do better, we now have the means, the investment and the resources to raise those standards. Mr. Speaker, in addition to mandating new curriculum that is relevant to young people like life and job skills, we're investing with over 381 new math educators in the classroom. This is all designed to lift standards for better schools, better outcomes and better jobs for the young people of this province. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Premier. Last week, this government overruled years of work and consultation by local representatives in Waterloo Region by unilaterally rewriting the local official plan, moving urban boundaries, and violating the countryside line to open previously protected lands to development. The Premier went so far as to call this a no-brainer, insulting both the people who worked on the original plan and the people of Waterloo who know it is neither necessary nor wanted and there is zero consultation. My question to the Premier, why does he think he's so smart? Uh, than why does he think he's smarter than the people of Waterloo Region uh, and the people who serve in that community that he's dictating this plan to? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, uh, Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government has a plan to build 1.5 million homes by 2031. We're pleased uh, to uh, work with councils on their official plan, and uh, official plans as those in this chamber who served at the municipal level, just like our guests that are here for Good Roads, knows that official plans are the most important playbooks for development in their community. We want to ensure that all of the official plans that are before us uh, reflect our government's policies. But don't take my word for it. Uh, let's hear from Waterloo Region Chair Karen Redman. The regional official plan is not a one and done, said Redmond. We always acknowledged that when you're looking at the kind of rapid growth that we're experiencing, we'd have to revisit the regional official plan over time. We know that we're going to grow, so we need to do it 
to ensure that it's well Fonts? thought out planning, that there are a variety of housing, that we have townhomes, that we have stacked townhomes, that we have rental accommodation for people who are going to come to our community. We agree with Chair Redmond, and that's exactly how we move forward. The supplementary question. The Minister will know that Waterloo Region relies mostly on an aquifer for drinking water, yet no analysis has been done to determine the threshold for servicing water or what way systems. Uh, this government has gutted the Grand River Conservation Authority, allowing development on wetlands. This government has approved a property in this plan called Big Springs for development that the region has opposed for decades due to hydrological sensitivity. This approval runs counter to groundwater sources protection. It almost, it's almost like you forgot forgotten all about Walkerton. Source water protection is key to our health, is key to our econ economy and viability. And can this minister then, if he's so proud of this plan, produce the hydrological studies that will reassure our citizens, or are you just so willing to gamble the health and well-being and economy of the people of Waterloo Region? Uh, the I want to I wanna table words from Kitchener Mayor Barry Verbanek today. His quote, I think the main parts of the regional official plan have been adopted, and that includes things like protecting the countryside line, things like protecting things like the major transit areas uh, in the city of Kitchener. It also recognizes that there were some areas that we felt, for example, in southwest Kitchener, that those lands should be, in fact, included. I think the decision of the minister recognizes there are lots of strong arguments about why those lands needed to be included. We're going to continue to stand with Mayor Verbanek and Chair Redmond as we move forward to build 1.5 million homes by 2031. Next question, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Since our government was first elected in 2018, we have been laser focused on making life more affordable for all Ontarians. Under the previous Liberal government, energy costs skyrocketed, forcing individuals and families to make difficult financial decisions. That is why it is essential that our government address energy costs by placing a strong emphasis on choice for consumers and providing all Ontarians with options to reduce their energy expenses. Our government must continue to respect the people of Ontario by implementing affordable energy policies. I understand that last week our government announced a new program that will give families and small businesses more ways to save on their energy bills. Speaker, can the minister please explain how this new electricity price plan will help Ontarians going forward? Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. I appreciate it, Speaker. He is quite correct. We've been hard at work putting families back in charge of their energy bills since we formed the government back in 2018. We started by introducing customer choice on electricity plans, allowing Ontarians to choose a price plan that makes sense for them, either a time of use or a tiered rate. Mr. Speaker, we also introduced the Green Button program, which is being rolled out right across Ontario as we speak. Mr. Wow. Speaker, will be in full implementation in November. And now we've taken the next step. Last week down at Toronto Hydro, I had the opportunity to inform the public about our ultra-low overnight electricity rate, which starting on May 1st, customers in the member's own riding wow. in Renfrew and in Toronto and London and Centre Wellington and Wasaga, I'm sure it was a great weekend at the beach up there, Mr. Speaker, they can opt Spons. in on this new plan, the ultra-low ultra -low overnight rate that's going to be available province-wide wow. in the coming months. That's fantastic. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is encouraging news to hear that our government has introduced yet another way for consumers to keep costs down, save money, and take control of their energy bills. Here, here. I know that my constituents, along with people all across Ontario, are looking for financial relief on their electricity bills and will want to know if this new price program will work best for them. As with any new initiative, it is necessary that our government provides information to the people of Ontario about how to opt into this program and how this will help them to save money on their electricity bills. Speaker, can the Minister please explain the benefits that this program will bring to the consumers and to Ontario's energy system? Minister of Energy. 
Thanks again uh, to the great member. This new rate plan is going to help families. It's going to help small businesses who use more electricity during the overnight period. With an ultra-low off-peak rate of 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour, shift workers or those who heat their homes using electricity or people charging an electric vehicle, and we know there's going to be more of them as we continue to build up to 400,000 here by the end of the decade in Ontario, they'll be able to save up to $90 a year on their bills using this rate. And unlike the former Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, which sold clean nighttime power to neighboring jurisdictions, sometimes Awful. and many times at a loss, Mr. Speaker, our government's coming up with innovative ways to use that power and shift demand in the province in the overnight period, which will make our grid more efficient, saving our electricity grid up to $5.7 million, which at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, isn't just going to save those folks who adopt the ultra-low overnight rate, it's going to save every electricity customer in the province money on their bill, wow. Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Uh, in the north, we have uh, a crisis of uh, people without homes in Kenora and across northwestern Ontario. Without 24-7 support, there will be more needless deaths of First Nations people living outside. What is this government doing to, uh, to give mun municipalities and advocates the resources they need to help people without homes. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for his question. In fact, in uh, this last budget under the leadership of our Premier, we recognize the urgent need for adequate housing to meet the basic needs of many First Nations who are moving from their uh, uh, communities into uh, towns and cities like Kenora, like Dryden, and like Sioux Lookout. And that's why we invested uh, significant resources, Mr. Speaker, uh, to ensure that the homeless prevention program moving forward uh, provides those additional Order. housing. This is sensitive, Mr. Speaker, to the nuances of housing requirements for Indigenous peoples displaced from uh, their home communities and are at risk of, of, uh, of home homelessness and, and require wraparound services from community Response. support organizations. It's a fully integrated model, Mr. Speaker, and we're, uh, we're endeavouring to address those matters. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. When we move uh, off the north, our uh, First Nation communities reserves is a marker of how that's how colonialism works to get people off our traditional territories. And uh, homelessness, Mr. Speaker, is a marker of uh, a bigger issue, and I'm talking about addictions. I know there is a need for healing, there is a need for treatment in the North that is not being met. Again, we have to send out people to urban centers to get treatment. Speaker, today, First Nations uh, people are dying. What is this government? doing to address the addiction crisis. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you <clears throat> excuse me, to the member opposite for that question. It's a very important question, and our government is taking the issue very, very seriously in terms of the investments that are being made in northern communities, in remote communities, and of course in indigenous communities. There is no exception. We are following through and making the investments. In October of 2021, we announced $36 million for community-led Indigenous mental health and addiction service organizations, including supports for students, victim services, and Indigenous-driven anti-opioid strategy. Our Addiction Recovery Fund was de designed to boost capacity in communities of the greatest need. 400 beds, 7,000 spaces, 56% of them in northern and Indigenous communities, in addition to $7 million for land-based care, because we Response. know that culturally safe services need to be delivered to the people where and where they are. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. The housing crisis is making life unaffordable in Ontario and driving young workers out of the province. This government claims to understand the issue, but their actions say otherwise. They commissioned an expert task force to address the problem, yet they've ignored the experts and one of their most important recommendations. 
to build density in our towns and cities, not to expand their boundaries outward. And yet the province last week ordered cities to do just that and destroy neighbouring farmland. This attack on farmers will reduce the supply of local food, raising food prices, and create more sprawl, which undermines our carbon reduction goals. Farmers are against this decision, cities and regions are against it, and the government's own experts are against it. My question to the Premier, who is telling the Premier that he should pave over our farmland, and are, the th are they the same people who will benefit from this decision? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, it's, you know, it's pretty rich coming from the Liberals yeah. who basically did nothing sure, yeah. on housing for 15 years to now try to be the champion for farmers, right? <laughs> Almost every budget that I sat in opposition on, the word agriculture never appeared in a Liberal budget. Yeah. Never. What about the you know, tax? so now we have a policy that actually recognizes that a farm can now have the opportunity to sever a lot for a son or daughter. That's a farm that if they decided that they wanted to provide housing, quality housing for workers on the site, they could sever a lot. So, so now we know again where the Liberals are at, just like they were at for 15 years uh, when they were in government. They stand such. against agriculture, they stand against farmers, and they stand against housing in rural areas. Sounds about That's right. the Liberal Party. Sounds about right. Order. The supplementary question. Speaker, this government says they represent farmers and, and the minister across the road seems to feel that as well. In fact, the Premier said he loves our farmers and told them in 2018 that help is on the way. But farmers are not feeling the love as the Premier paves over more and more of their farmland. We know this Order. because the great riding of Haldeman Norfolk in the heart of farm country elected an independent over a pro-developer candidate supported by this government. The member for Haldeman Norfolk introduced a bill to protect our farmland from development, and it was supported by the Ontario Federation of Agriculture and all MPPs except those on the government side. This government is being very clear. They want to pave over farmland. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Order. Can the Premier please explain how paving over their farmland helps farmers? I come to order. To reply, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, the member opposite is clearly out of touch because for the last number of weeks we've been making historic announcements. We're investing over $2 billion in Ontario's agri-food industry from, from the laneway through to processing. And farmers are buoyed, they're energized, they know they have a government in. Premier Ford and all of us in caucus that actually understand the business of producing food. For instance, we have introduced a soil health study that RBC noted as a hidden gem in the budget. It's $9.5 million that is going to look at the health of soil. And I was just at the Earlton Farm Show this past weekend, and people are applauding the fact that we actually get it and are demonstrating that we are moving on priorities that truly matter to farmers that are working so hard to produce Spons? good quality food in Ontario. Thank you very much. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Ajax. My question is for the Attorney General. I've heard from many of my constituents, both tenants and landlord, concerning the delays they're experiencing when they engage with the Landlord Tenant Board. There are many reports of the long delays when it comes to hearings to resolve tenancy disputes, causing uncertainty and confusion to both tenants and landlords. The consensus is that the time frames are way too long, the case loads are too heavy, and service standards need to be strengthened. As a government, we must put forward the resolutions that will make wait times shorter and re res results much faster for those involved. Speaker, can the Attorney General please explain how our government is taking action to address and resolve disputes at the Landlord Tenant Board? Great question. No, to reply. 
Speaker, and, and I appreciate the question from the member from Ajax. It's no secret that our government has been making historical progress when it comes to solving the house, housing crisis right here in Ontario. Our efforts, though, are more than just building homes. And that's why I was really proud to stand with my colleague, Minister Clark, in London earlier this month to announce that we're doubling the number of adjudicators. Here, here. And that's going to help, Mr. Speaker. We know delays around the Landlord-Tenant Board have been frustrating for people across this province, both for landlords and for tenants. But it's been our government that has been the ones getting it done when it comes to improving services here in Ontario, and that includes the Landlord-Tenant Board. And by doubling the number of adjudicators, Mr. Speaker, more Ontarians will have their cases heard in an efficient manner. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Attorney General for that response. My constituents will be encouraged to hear that the Landlord Tenant Board capacities has, is holding more hearings and seeing more improvements. Increasing the number of adjudicators is a positive step towards speeding up decisions. The Landlord Tenant Board is part of our province tribunal system that plays an important role in providing accessible dispute resolution to thousands of Ontarians. It is essential that our government continues to make investments that will modernize services so that people of our province can have confidence in our tribunal. Speaker, can the Attorney General please explain further how our government is making investments to improve access? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and, and it's, it, she's correct. We've been making necessary investments at the Landlord Tenant Board over time. And as I mentioned previously, we're doubling the number of full time adjudicators by adding 40 full time members plus additional support staff for a total of six hundred or six and a half million dollars, Mr. Speaker. And that's part of our historic housing strategy. With this announcement, the board will have 80 full time adjudicators. And to help Ontarians appear before them, we're also making the processes easier. And that's why, in this budget, an investment of over $24 million over three years was made. Of course, the NDP voted against it. Mm. And, well, we made an investment of $6 million for additional recruitment at the Landlord Tenant Board, and the NDP voted against that. These, in these investments follow a $28.5 million funding arrangement for, under the Justice Accelerated Strategy to improve processes in the digital case management process. Mr. Speaker... The NDP voted against that. Now, unfortunately, they keep saying no. But fortunately, That's the no Democratic we keep vote. passing it and we keep moving forward, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to continuously improving the process and making Fox. the wait time shorter and making the process more efficient. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question. The member for Mosquito Walk, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier, uh, the natural gas price in Northern Ontario is unbearable. Residents have no surplus in their budget. Uh, businesses and non uh, non profits are, have faced difficulties. Uh, we, uh, our use in the north is much higher than the, because of our longer winters than in the south. So the calculations for us does not reflect our need. Is, it's completely unjust. Uh, the, uh, the greenhouse, uh, someone who pays uh, uh, 20, 80, uh, been after uh, using new equipment for the premier. What is your government help? People in the north with their electricity and uh, organizations such as the Maison Verte with the costs in, in, in energy. Uh, Thank you for the question. It's difficult to understand the question by the member because. <laughs> the, the, the member opposite is saying he wants more affordable energy for people in the north. That's exactly what we've been providing since we took government back in 28, Mr. Speaker. But the member opposite and his party was all about supporting the Liberals' Green Energy Act when they were in power, Mr. Speaker. You know, during the Green Energy Act, we saw hydro bills rising by 10, 12 percent each year, Mr. Speaker. In 2018, that came to an end. We Order. ended the madness, Mr. Order. Speaker. But you know what the NDP wanted to do while the Liberals were doing that? They wanted them to go faster, Mr. Order. Speaker. They wanted to, them to put more over-market renewable contracts on the grid, Mr. Response. Speaker. Since we've come into power, we've flattened those increases in the electricity sector, and I'll have more to say about natural gas in my supplementary. The supplementary question, the member for him. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I'm just going to go back to the Premier because 
because the words that I would have to say to that are terribly unparliamentary. <laughs> Seniors on fixed incomes are struggling the most when it comes to the cost of utilities and natural gas. A senior from Hamilton Mountain shared with me that her utility bills are so high she had to wear coats and use two to three blankets overnight just to be able to keep warm in her own home. Speaker, this Order. is absolutely disgraceful. Maybe the member from Niagara West Glenbrook doesn't have these problems, nor in Niagara West, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but the government needs to be ashamed. I'm not sure any of these members across the aisle were using coats and blankets in their homes to stay warm. Can the Premier explain why seniors Order. like my constituent are supposed to survive this affordability crisis when they are being priced out of basic necessities? House Leader will come to order to reply the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, it's impossible to take this member seriously when she talks about order. affordability. Because it was this party in 2018 that ended the Liberals' cap and trade and fought the carbon tax all the way to the Supreme Court. That was the Premier that led that charge, Mr. Speaker. The NDP. The NDP want a bigger carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. The Premier and our Minister of Energy at the time warned the people of Ontario that the carbon tax wasn't going to just drive up the cost of utilities higher, it was going to drive up the cost of everything, including groceries, in our grocery Order. stores, Mr. Speaker. And you know what? That is exactly what has happened. Life in Ontario is more unaffordable today because of the federal carbon tax, which that no, member Justin. and her party supports. Stand with us and fight. Order. The member for Ottawa South come to order. The member for Waterloo come to order. Member for Nepean come to order. Member for Ottawa South come to order. Member for Kitchener Conestoga come to order. Start the clock. The member for Peterborough Quartha. Next question. This morning I have a question for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skill Development. The important work that our miners do is vital to building a strong Ontario, not just in the mining industry, but other industries as well. As just one example, mineral resources are needed for our manufacturing sector in making electric vehicles. That's right. And over the next decade, critical minerals will be needed in many more areas for our expanding economic markets. Bang on. Speaker, workplace safety in this sector is also a condition for success in developing the critical minerals industry for the future of our province. Miners have been the backbone of Ontario's economy for generations, and we owe it to them and to their families to do more to keep them safe. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to protect the miners of Ontario? Reply, Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Speaker, and thank you to the member for uh, Peterborough Kawartha for that important question. Mm -hmm. Speaker, on Monday of last week, I had the pleasure to join my good friend, the Minister of Mines in Sudbury, with the President of the United Steelworkers Union Local 6500 uh, to announce new measures our government is taking to keep Ontario's more than 29,000 miners safe. Lowering exposure limits to diesel exhaust is something that miners and their unions have been calling for for years, and we're listening. Working closely with the United Steelworkers, we have acted quickly on their concerns, concerns the previous Liberal government left unanswered. Our government, under the leadership of our Premier, is proposing new regulations that bring Ontario's exposure limits from the highest in Canada down to the most protective in all of North America. Yep. Speaker, we know there's more work to be done, and working together with our Labour Bons. partners and employers, we will keep the men and women in Ontario's minors safe. Commentary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for that uh, response, but I, I'm, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Uh, so my supplementary question is to the Minister of Mines. As the Minister is well aware, through his long and extensive career in the mining industry, there are many occupational risks that workers face every time they start a shift underground. This announcement by the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skill Development is another milestone for workplace safety for miners that our province can be proud of. 
However, there's always more work to be done when it comes to ensuring workplace safety in this sector. Speaker, can the Minister of Mines please describe the importance of this announcement in the context of our government's goal to strengthen Ontario's critical mineral supply chain? That's a good question. Reply, the Minister of Mines. Thank you for the member of the question and the Minister for a great announcement last week. Speaker, I come from a very proud mining family that's been in the industry for over 100 years. I lived and worked in the communities, the mining communities. Safety continues to be our top priority, but we can always do better. That is why this annou announcement is so important, because we are improving workplace safety for miners. Speaker, as our government works to build more mines to supply the EV revolution, we need the world's best and brightest to join our industry. This announcement sends a strong message that you can find safe, rewarding careers in Ontario's mining industry. I am proud to be a part of a government that puts people first and sets them up for exciting jobs that will make them part of a growing supply chain for electric vehicles in this province. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. Speaker, it has been three long years since this government introduced Bill 124. Does the Premier think freezing the wages of healthcare workers during a pandemic helped with the recruitment, helped with the retention? In hindsight, does the Premier think it was a good idea? President of the Treasury Board, to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government has launched the largest health care recruitment uh, strategy in the history of this province. And the members opposite, Mr. Speaker, that member and the members opposite on the uh, opposition side have voted against that. In fact, this year alone, Mr. Speaker, over 12,000 nurses uh, were registered. Over 12,000 nurses registered. That is the largest uh, number of uh, registered nurses in the history wow. of this province. Wow. We put over $342 million in last year's fall economic statement to support the upskilling uh, of certain nurses and healthcare professionals across this province. And every single time that we have put forward measures, investments, billions of dollars into healthcare and recruitment, the members opposite have voted against it every single time. Question. Thank you, Speaker. Although the Premier does not think that our health care heroes deserve a raise, it turns out that both employers and employees agree on retroactive pay and are for work done during the pandemic, with nurses and paramedics being awarded back pay as we speak. The time has come for this Premier to start working for workers, to treat our health care workers as heroes. Will the Premier withdraw his appeal of Bill 124? Reply for the government, the Premier. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you what we did for the health care workers. We gave the nurses a $5,000 bonus, which was equivalent to a 7.6% increase, the highest in the entire country. And guess what? The NDP and the Liberals voted against it. Mr. Speaker, we gave the PSWs the largest increase they've ever seen at $3 per hour. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? The NDP and the Liberals vote against it. We made sure we paid for the tuition for the nurses, all expenses if they worked in a rural community. The NDP voted against it. We have the highest minimum wage in the entire country, Mr. Speaker. The NDP and Liberals voted against it. We're making sure we put money back into people's pockets. 60,000 new nurses have been registered since we took office. As the, as the President of the Treasury said, 12,000 new nurses came on the job. Response. That is a record. We have 30,000 in the queue at the colleges and universities. That's what we're doing for our frontline workers. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Member for Waterloo, come to order. The Minister of Labour, come to order.
member for Kitchener Conestoga come to order. The next question, start the clock. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development. Our province, like the rest of the world, is experiencing the impacts of global economic uncertainty, high interest rates, and inflation. This current economic climate is creating additional barriers and burdens that are disproportionately affecting communities in remote, rural, and northern regions more profoundly. These barriers are hindering opportunities for job creation, education, and business development in the north. Because the previous Liberal government ignored the needs of Northern Ontario, it is vitally important that our government takes action to keep the North competitive and improve the quality of life for all Northerners. Speaker, can the Minister please explain how our government is supporting opportunities and prosperity in the North? Minister of Northern Development. Well, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's a number of ways, and under the leadership of uh, this Premier, we've made it very clear that we're building Ontario, and that means building Northern Ontario. Maybe I'll start, Mr. Speaker, uh, with an ode to Good Roads Conference this week and mention that uh, uh, we started out uh, with uh, a couple of key announcements from the Manitoba border. Uh, Niwit Wendemek uh, Limited, Highway uh, Twinning, Mr. Speaker, not only has it been extended, but we work cooperatively with an Indigenous owned and operated business who play a substantial, in fact a majority uh, role in the construction of that twinned highway as well. We were in Dryden to announce the Grand Trunk Avenue, which is also the Trans-Canada Highway, leads right into Dryden under major reconstruction and planning uh, and design uh, resources for Fort Francis 3rd Street West, which is also Trans-Canada. These highways are important connections, Mr. Speaker, for our vast region, but they get goods and people across Northern Ontario, and we're committed to making sure that Northern Ontario's uh, roads are safe and efficient. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is encouraging news that our government is making meaningful investments to support economic development and growth in the North. We know that the strength of Ontario's economy is built on the knowledge, skills and expertise of our workers. Education is the key in preparing workers to take on the jobs of the future, especially in view of increasing labour shortages and the urgent need to fill job vacancies across many sectors. Our government must continue to do all that we can to work with our northern partners to foster innovation in order to build strong and prosperous businesses and communities. Speaker, can the Minister please expand on how our government is investing in the North and creating opportunities for future generations? Minister of Northern Development. Just a great opportunity, Mr. Speaker, in the week prior to, uh, to last and last week to travel uh, uh, from Sudbury to Pekanjikum and spend some time uh, in Kenora and Dryden, Mr. Speaker, making the kinds of investments that transform the lives uh, of people in our northern communities. Whether we're upgrading the facilities at the Dryden Public Library, Mr. Speaker, or investing uh, in uh, a recreational facilitator program in Vermilion Bay, Mr. Speaker, or investing in a youth wellness hub in Pekanjikum First Nations and seeing for the first time in more, more than 30 years of being uh, a part of that community, uh, Mr. Speaker, a sawmill. These are exciting opportunities that range from skills development to quality of life in our Fonts. small northern towns and cities, Mr. Speaker. We're looking forward to a dynamic, vibrant northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, which can join southern Ontario in one of the most exciting economic periods in its history. Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is ready. Next question, the member for Hamilton West, and Castor Dundas. My question this morning is to the Premier of Ontario. As reported in the Hamilton Spectator, 2,100 kids are waiting for surgery at McMaster's Children's Hospital. It's the worst wait in the province for pediatric surgery. No child should have to live in pain, pain that is entirely preventable. Imagine being a parent watching your child live with pain and knowing that if they miss important surgeries, it can have life-altering consequences. McMaster is doing everything they can, and the federal government has stepped in to help as well. When will your government step up and do your part to help these children? Good job. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. 
Mr. Speaker, you know, the member opposite is absolutely right. McMaster is doing incredible work. And in fact, it is because of the work and innovation that's happening there that we were able to, in the fall, add an additional six bed ICU capacity because we know that parents, children should not have to wait for these needed surgeries. It's, uh, it speaks to the investments that we continue to make and working with those partners. You know, recently, last month, I was at the Ron Joyce uh, Center and seeing the incredible work that they are able to do when they get a government and a partner just speaks to how we can improve the system if we work together. And that's exactly what we're doing with McMaster. Thank you. The supplementary question. Premier, things aren't getting better under your government, they're getting worse. And this is an emergency all across Ontario. There's 12,000 Ontario children waiting for surgery right now. Bruce Squires, the president of McMaster's Children's Hospital, shared his deep concern that 1,400 children have already missed optimal window for surgery and they now risk life-altering consequences, lifelong consequences because they're missing surgeries. Our children urgently need your help, Premier. Your government has, to fix the has the power. You can fix this today. Premier, will you help these children? Minister of Health. Thank you. Perhaps the member opposite didn't hear me clearly. We have been making investments. We have been working in particular with our children's hospital partnerships. In fact, we've made permanent investments, increasing the number of critical beds in Children's Hospital in Eastern Ontario, Master Children's Hospital, of course, in Hamilton, London Health Sciences, uh, the hospitals for sick killed children, and of course, Kingston Health Sciences. We've made those investments permanent because as we saw the need, we increase and we ensure that those capacities are in improving. It, uh, it continues to amaze me that the member opposite is not actually encouraging and working and talking to the hospital CEOs to see the kind of innovation that is happening in their community hospitals because it truly is world-renowned uh, and working. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, Mr. Speaker, is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, the, the people in my great riding of Durham and across the GTHA have public transit as their pri primary form of transportation. But many riders within Durham and across the GTHA, using a host of different agencies, can get confused by the various fare systems and payment methods under different municipal transit services. My constituents have been asking for simpler ways to pay the fare, especially first-time transit users who may not always carry cash. S Mr. Speaker, therefore, can the minister please share with this House how our government is making it easier and more convenient to take transit in my riding and across the greater Toronto-Hamilton area? And to respond, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you, Speaker. And the member's right. It should be easier to tap and get down to watch the Leafs win the Cup this year <laughs> when you're taking public transit, Speaker. That's what we're doing. Uh, through last summer and this winter, we introduced credit card tap on the Presto uh, across Go and the 905. And, Speaker, I'm glad to say that across participating agencies, riders have now tapped with their credit card one million times. Wow. Doesn't stop there though, Speaker. Metrolinx is now also working to implement debit card tap very soon in the 905 and across the GO network. And what's more, Speaker, Metrolinx, on behalf of our government, has done great work with the TTC to update Presto devices so both credit card and debit tap payment features can be brought to the hard working people of the six later this year. Speaker. It's not enough just to build record transit, which we're doing under the leadership of this response. Premier. We're bringing game-changing initiatives, making it easier for connecting the, to the grid and getting down to watch our boys in blue. Uh, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for his response. It is great to see our government provide transit riders with more choices that make it easier for them to travel. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians have seen a rise in their cost of living, and this is due to global inflation and economic instability, of course. For many of them, transit fares add to the financial burden they are already bearing. Our government must continue to remove barriers to ridership 
and make life more affordable for the hard-working individuals and families in my riding of Durham and across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, therefore, can the Associate Minister explain how our government is offering Ontarians cost-effective ways to travel, particularly on public transit? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, speaker, the member is absolutely right. As we get back to normal times and navigate economic uncertainty, we have to make sure that we are putting money back into people's pockets. That includes yeah, yeah. our transit riders. Speaker, in contrast to the previous Liberal government with its transit hikes over six straight years when they were in power, Metrolinx under our government has not increased transit fares for the past four years. Mm. What's more, Speaker, our GO affordability pilot provided a 50% reimbursement for applicable GO riders in Peel Region. We're also delivering for the hard-working youth uh, and students of this province because no matter where you're enrolled, or if you're between the ages of 13 and 19, we nearly doubled the youth and post-secondary discount to 40% off the standard fare on GO and UP Express. Speaker, let's not forget, we Once. eliminated double fares for riders connecting to GO Transit and major 905 transit agencies, saving up to $1,800 a year, making it more affordable to get down and watch our Jays in action this summer, wherever you need to go. Good. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In the middle of the night outside a local shelter, Olivia's makeshift tent went up in flames. The, the shelter beds inside were unavailable because provincial funding had run out. Olivia suffered severe burns to nearly half of her body. She's now fighting for her life. I want to send strength to Olivia's parents, Sean and Stephanie, as well as her friends and the service providers who knew her so well. The City of London has doubled the number of unhoused people compared to two years ago. Double. 1,868 lives hanging in the balance and the province is, is ignoring it. Will this government do the right thing? Invest in affordable and supportive housing, wrap around supports, rent, expand rent supplement programs, and fund municipalities properly to ensure that shelters don't have to close when the need is so high. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I'm not sure where the question is coming from. We made a historic investment under the leadership of Premier Ford and uh, Minister Beth and Falvey. 202 million additional for the homeless prevention program. You know, you know, Speaker. Members were in their ridings uh, last week for break week, and some of the announcements that have come out of our municipal partners have been amazing. Uh, you know, now, Speaker, with this extra $202 million, our homelessness prevention program now provides funding of almost $700 million to provide service managers like the one that the member opposite just talked about, additional funds to keep shelters open, to, to build capacity. So, you know, definitely we'll be reaching out on what uh, the City of London will be doing with the extra dollars that the government just gave them and that the member opposite voted against. Okay. That concludes our question period for